Hello. This is our educational video focusing in on the bundles of care for sepsis with an update from 2015. I'd like to begin by discussing the definitions of sepsis, which is infection, which is either a known or suspected source, plus two or more SERS criteria that you can see here, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and white count. Severe sepsis is sepsis with acute organ dysfunction. And you can see here examples of the different organ dysfunction, including hyperlactatemia. And septic shock is severe sepsis syndrome in which the patient, despite adequate, appropriate, and timely volume resuscitation, remains hypotensive and vasopressor dependent. These are the all-important surviving sepsis campaign bundles. As you can see here, there is a three-hour bundle and a six-hour bundle. And I will show you at the end, there has been a slight change to the six-hour bundle, given some recent data. As you can see here, the three-hour bundle is to measure a lactate level, obtain cultures prior to admission of antibiotics, to administer broad-spectrum antibiotics, and to administer a 30 milliliter per kilogram crystalloid bolus for hypotension or hyperlactatemia. The bundle within six hours, as you can see here, is to apply vasopressors appropriately, and in the event of persistent arterial hypotension, to measure a central venous pressure and to measure a central venous oxygen saturation, and you can see targets here, and to remeasure a lactate if the initial lactate was elevated. More details in terms of particular goals during the first six hours of a central venous pressure of between 8 and 12, a mean arterial pressure target of greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury, and a urine output of greater than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. And you can see here targets for central venous or mixed venous oxygen saturation. The diagnosis is important from an infectious disease standpoint that cultures should be obtained as clinically appropriate before antimicrobial therapy, at least two sets of blood cultures, appropriate imaging studies, and they say, according to the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, to consider assays for fungal antigens if available. The focus on this slide is on antimicrobial therapy, and as they point out, as we do commonly in critically ill patients with severe sepsis, we hit hard, we hit broad, and we hit early, and then we do everything we can to perform antibiotic de-escalation. Fluid therapy, again, recommendation of crystalloid as the initial therapy uh, that we should not be using hydroxyethyl starch, and to use albumin when the patient requires substantial amounts of crystalloid. As I mentioned previously, the initial fluid challenge should be 30 milliliters per kilogram. And again, the fluid challenge should be continued as long as there is evidence of improvement with either dynamic variables such as change in pulse pressure or static variables such as the arterial blood pressure. Again, some commonly used targets for vasopressors are to achieve a mean arterial pressure of greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury, that norepinephrine should be used as a first choice presser in general, vasopressin can be added, epinephrine should then be next, and rarely, if ever, uh, dopamine. Phenylephrine in general is not recommended, and you can see some of the recommendations here and low-dose dopamine is no longer recommended either. A trial of an inotrope can be considered, but again, this is rarely done clinically. This can often exacerbate hypotension. In general, corticosteroids are not used as routine therapy for patients with severe sepsis syndrome. You can see some further data here. In general, we transfuse blood products only when the hemoglobin is less than 7 with a target of 7 to 9.
Patients with severe sepsis syndrome and septic shock can develop ARDS from either direct or indirect lung injury. And the focus, as in the surgical ICU, is a target tidal volume of 6 milliliters per kilogram predicted body weight and keeping the plateau pressures less than 30 centimeters of water. These are some of the recommended guidelines from the ARDSnet protocol, and uh, you can take some time and look at them here. Patients should have the head of the bed elevated, there should be weaning protocols in place, and that a PA catheter should not routinely be used in every patient. Glucose control, current targets are around 180 or less, and do not routinely use bicarb in patients if their pH is greater than 7.15. Again, DVT and GI prophylaxis in the appropriate patients is important, nutrition is important, and focusing in on goals of care, as in every critically ill patient, is important. I would like to focus in for a moment on some of the recent updates to the six-hour bundle. And as you can see here, this is the original six-hour bundle of applying vasopressors for persistent hypotension, and in the event of persistent hypotension, reassess volume status according to Table 1. And if you look at Table 1, which is here, there are now two ways of documenting reassessment of volume status and tissue perfusion. Either repeat focused exam after initial fluid resuscitation by licensed independent practitioner including vital signs, cardiopulmonary, capillary refill, pulse, and skin findings, or two of the following, measuring a central venous pressure, measuring an SCVO2, central venous oxygen, bedside cardiovascular ultrasound, or dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness with passive leg raise or fluid challenge. We hope you found this sepsis educational video to be helpful and always remember that there is a sepsis order set in Sunrise Clinical Manager. Thank you very much.